It is good to be here worshiping together uh, this morning. Um, this is the 10th Pillar Church uh, in the Praetorian Project, so it is good to be with you here this morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to continue on in the study that you guys have been a part of for several weeks now um, in the Sermon on the Mounts. Uh, what you have been calling the good life. And uh, so it started with uh, the Beatitudes at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5. And uh, Jesus is telling them what it looks like to uh, live the good life. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, he goes on with many blesseds. Then we get the powerful verse in verse 17, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, Jesus says. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then he goes on and he starts talking about, you have heard that it was said, and then he says something else. And so he's kind of walking through the law and thinking about those things. This morning, we're going to be down in Matthew 5, uh, verses 32 through, or 38 through 42. So I'll read that here in a second. But to get us prepared for what the Word is going to say to us this morning, I want you to imagine, and maybe you don't have to imagine, maybe there's a time in your past so you can just recollect. But I want you to imagine that somebody walks up to you and slaps you in the face. What's your initial response to that? I have to imagine that uh, it may not be where the text is going to lead us this morning. Right? You have an initial response. I have an initial response to someone walking up and smacking you in the face. That's one of the things that Jesus is going to address. And I want you to imagine, though, if you got to a point in your life where someone could walk up to you full of anger, full of vitriol, full of just disdain for you, and smack you in the face, and you do nothing. And you just say, man, I'm, I'm going to go here now, right? Just imagine what that would look like. Imagine what it would look like if they smack you in the face and you say, you know, you can actually smack me again if you need to. What would it take? What would it take for that to happen, that type of change to happen in your life from the initial response you had when I said, what if somebody comes and smacks you in the face, to that response of not retaliating? or even allowing it to continue. You see, ever since the fall of mankind, your reaction, your initial reaction, uh, ever since Genesis chapter 3 and the fall of mankind, that's been the initial reaction. We are bent towards, our fallen sinful nat nature is bent towards retaliation. But it's not just retaliation of, you smack me, I'm going to try to smack you with equal amount and force, right? That's not what we do with retaliation, right? You punch me in the mouth, I want to punch you in the mouth so hard that you never think about doing that again, right? That's what we think about, right? We think we watch revenge movies, right? When we watch re revenge movies, it's never like, oh, this thing happened and then this guy exacted justice in a way that was exactly what had happened to him. No, no, no. Like, oh, you... You took my daughter, I'm going to kill all of you, right? That's, that's the plot line of, uh, of a lot of these uh, movies, right? So we have this bent towards retaliation. But God's people are supposed to be different. God's people are to be people who care about justice, but not always in the way that we might think. This morning, we're going to see this. Jesus' disciples do not resist the one who is evil against us. Jesus' disciples do not resist the one who is evil 
against us. Pick it up with me in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Let us pray. God, I pray that you would help us to understand the truths of this passage. Ultimately, I pray that you would help us to see that Jesus ultimately fulfills the law of this passage, and that each one here would place our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone, and after which, that we would start to live like him. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, overarching idea for this morning is that Jesus' disciples do not resist the one who is evil against us. And as you think about that, what would cause you to be able to do that? What types of things would have to be true for that to be able to happen? The structure this morning, we're going to see this very familiar pattern that you've already seen in Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you, and then we're going to get to what he actually says to us. And then we are going to conclude with how Jesus fulfills this portion of the scripture So first we see, you have heard that it was said. You have heard that it was said. Notice in verse 38, Jesus, right in in just the rhythm that he has been in in this sermon, you have heard that it was said. Well, notice what it says. You shall love the Lord, or sorry, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You may say, well, where would they have heard such a thing? Uh, most of your Bibles probably have a footnote that tell you where that quotation is from. It's from Exodus 21. It's also in Leviticus chapter 24. It's also in Deuteronomy chapter 19. And honestly, this concept, this idea is really throughout the Old Testament law. This is a law for justice, but it is a law for measured justice. You see, the retaliation that we have in our sinful hearts is to go beyond just an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. Our retaliation wants more, right? So we aim for earthly justice that goes beyond just eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. And so what God tells his people in Exodus and Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, he tells the people of God, when you exact earthly justice, it needs to be measured, right? So if somebody gives somebody else a black eye, the penalty for that should be commiserate with the crime, right? So often when we have cries for injustice, a lot of times it's because nothing was done, right? If we think about civil law, we think about our government, we think about law enforcement, we think about the judicial system. A lot of times we're like, there's no justice at all. Some crime was committed and nothing happened. That's one level of injustice. But then there's another level of injustice where something small happened and the punishment was something large. God is telling his people this is not how it is supposed to be with the people of God. There is supposed to be earthly justice and that earthly justice is to be measured. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. So for us... Again, Jesus said back in uh, verse 17, he said he did not come to abolish the law. Like, hey, that that law is no good anymore. What he's saying is that he's talking about something else. That is the civil law, okay? So for us, for our application here, when it comes to civil law, when it comes to our government, actually this Old Testament law is a good place for us to look. There should be earthly justice, 
And that earthly justice should be measured justice. All right, so what I'm going to say here in the second portion of the sermon, if you're a law enforcement officer or if you're in the U.S. military, right, you, this is not how you go about your job that you turn to speak, right? You are an instrument of justice. You are there for the civil law, all right? So that justice should be firm, but it should be measured, okay? So that's the civil law. What Jesus is doing here is he's starting to untangle the civil law, what we would call what our government does, and he's trying to pull that apart from the moral law, what we as Christians are supposed to be doing and how we're supposed to interact with our fellow man. So understand, we have to divorce this a little bit, especially if you are an agent of the government, if you're a law enforcement officer, if you're in the military or something else, right? The answer is not always, well, I'll just let them off. That is not the only answer. If, if that was the only answer, your job would be really easy. Just hang out in the office, drink coffee, and allow the world to go to hell. But that is not what you're called to do if you are in civil government. But that's for the civil government. What does it say, what does Jesus say to us? First, we have to understand that Jesus does speak as one who has authority. So the second thing, Jesus says, but I say to you, and I know that uh, Pastor Mike and Pastor Ted have been harping on this. Jesus is speaking as one who has authority. Look, I understand this is in the Old Testament scripture, but you need to understand what that passage is about and apply it into this new reality, this new covenant, this kingdom of heaven you need to apply it here Jesus is going to say that citizens of the kingdom of God have a higher ethic than that of civil law let me say that again Christians disciples of Jesus Christ have a higher ethic than civil law right the hardest part of civil law is just figuring out who did what and then enacting that measured justice. But Jesus says there's a higher ethic for us. And so what we need to realize and what we need to wrestle with is, are we okay with that? Are we going to listen to what Jesus says or are we going to go with our version of what's right? No, 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 but they did this to me, so I get to do this to them, right? Are we going to go with our idea or are we going to go with Jesus' idea? The big question for us in each one of these, every time you see that in Matthew 5, 6, and say, 7, but I say to you, you should ask, do I really care what Jesus says? Am I going to conform my life to what Jesus says? If we really understand Proverbs 5, 6, and 7, we will have the same response that the hearers of this sermon had at the time. At the very end of Matthew 7, it says this, When Jesus was finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because he was teaching them as one who had authority. So the question is, does he have authority in your life to confront your initial responses to things? Or are you going to keep going with your initial responses? Do you submit to Jesus? He does say something to us. Next we see what he says to us. He says, do not resist the one who is evil. Notice these examples that he lists it says, do not resist the one who is evil in verse 39. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. One thing I think we need to understand, these are not hypothetical situations for the people listening to Jesus, right? This is not like, hey, uh, if this happens, sometimes we use that word if thinking like, oh, this may or may not happen, right? This is, this is more a when this happens, this is how you respond, okay? 
This isn't a if, like in the weird off chance that something like this happens, then you need to do this. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about when these things happen. All right? um, these are not theoretical examples. They are happening in the lives of these people. People are against them. People will, especially for the disciples moving forward, uh, people will be against them. Uh, those who are of Jewish descent who are listening, we assume most of the disciples at this point sitting under the teaching in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are Jews. Well, what, what do we know about Jews at this time? Well, they have leaders who are really bad leaders. They have enacted all of these rules and they are putting all of these rules onto the people and these rules are crushing the people. But not only that, but at the same time that they're doing that, they are living in privilege and they are not applying the rules to themselves. So these rules are for you, they're not for us. We live by a different set of rules. So those are their religious leaders of the day. You may say, well, what's the civil leadership of the day? Well, they're occupied by the Roman army. And so the Roman army is keeping peace, and the way that the Roman army kept peace was with a Roman soldier on every street corner. And they brutally kept the peace. So these are not hypothetical things. These are actual examples that they would have had to deal with. If someone slaps them on the cheek, they're not to fight back. They're to turn the other also. If someone would sue them to take their tunic, they are to be generous and they're to give their cloak as well. If anyone forces them to go one mile, they are to go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And the question for us is, what does this look like in your life? What is evil people turning against you? What does that look like in your life? What does turn the other cheek look like in your life? What does let him have your cloak as well look like in your life? What does go with the person that asked you to walk one mile, two miles, what does that look like for you? The one who is begging from you, what would it look like to not refuse them? You may think like generally, kind of society-wide, but I would actually encourage you to think about your actual life, real people in your life who are doing things like this towards you. They lash out against you and they are... Uh, doing things towards you, the Christian ethic, disciples of Jesus, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, are those who do not resist the one who is evil. I, I do have to give one caveat here, or one explanation perhaps, um, and that is to allow the civil government to do their job. Okay? Allow the civil government to do their job. And so if you are a victim of a crime, especially if you are a repeated victim of a crime, it is appropriate to report to the civil authorities what has happened and allow them to execute justice. Okay? So this passage, unfortunately, has been used by churches to take on the role of the civil government take on the role of civil judicial system and say, you know what, we're going to be Christians about this and we're going to overlook this sin, we're going to forgive this sin, and it has had grievous consequences. If you're curious and you want to go down this train, to, uh, down this path of what I'm talking about, uh, several years ago the Boston Globe did a series of articles highlighting uh, abuse in the Roman Catholic Church. And the way that that abuse was allowed to happen and continue to happen was the church got into the civil law business, and that's not our business anymore. Old Testament Israel, that was their business as well, not anymore for us. We should, those congregations should have reported the crimes to the civil, civil authorities and allowed them to... Uh, to adjudicate those things. And you may say, well, that's interesting. Well, the Southern Baptist Convention has had a similar scandal in our day. Uh, a f fewer years ago, I think it was two or three years ago, the Houston Chronicle 
uh, did a series of articles highlighting the same problems in Southern Baptist churches. So again, I'm, I'm not saying, like, we are not to pretend that we are a civil authority in the church. Well, I know that he did that, but we're going to be Christians here and we're going to forgive him. And we're not going, we're going to cover this up and not tell the civil authorities. That is not what we're called to do. That is not at all what Jesus is saying here. One of the ways that we allow this, to, one of the ways that we can be Christians and forgive people is allow the civil government to do their job and then we can do our job of working about redemption and healing and forgiveness and all the things that we should be doing as a church. We're able to do those when we allow the civil authorities to do their job as well. So we just have to clarify that. But how does this land with us? What are we to do in response to this teaching? Do not, as individuals, as Christians, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, how must we respond to this teaching when Jesus says, do not resist the one who is evil? What do we do with this? Well, first and foremost, we need to understand that we are one of the evil ones. We, each one of us in here, have done evil things to our fellow man. We have slapped people on the face. We have sued them. We have stolen from them. We have lied to them. We have wronged our fellow man. Each one of us. And you may, and so what do we deserve, right? Well, we deserve retaliation by our fellow man. We deserve judgment from our fellow man, but it's even bigger than that. We actually deserve judgments from almighty, all-knowing God. Well, if that's true, what do we do with that? And I, I think we all know it's true. Like, I have wronged other human beings. Every single person in here, unless you're self-deceived and lying to yourself, you have wronged fellow human beings. So what do you do with that? Well, we turn to Jesus. You see, Matthew does not end in Matthew chapter 5. As we continue to look, I encourage you to flip if you're in like a paper Bible, one of these old-fashioned paper Bibles, flip back to... uh, Matthew chapter 26, I'm going to like just skim over some things. What Jesus does, because Jesus fulfills the teaching that we were just in in Matthew 5. We see in the beginning of Matthew 26, I'm just going to read some of the headings. I might grab a verse from time to time. So in Matthew 26, there's a plot to kill Jesus. Uh, Down in verse 14, we find out that Judas, one of the 12 disciples, one of the closest 12 disciples of Jesus, he's going to betray Jesus. Jesus is still teaching. He celebrates the Passover with them. He institutes the Lord's Supper with his disciples. Next, what happens is he foretells Peter's denial. Peter is not just one of the 12. Peter is one of the inner three of the 12. He is probably the oldest disciple. He's probably looked to as a leader of the disciples. And Jesus foretells, hey, Peter, you're actually going to deny me when I go to the cross. Then Jesus prays in Gethsemane. You just see Jesus' faithfulness, right? All these things happening to him. He is instituting the Lord's Supper. Hey, Peter, you're going to deny me. He is praying for his disciples. In, uh, still in chapter 26, starting in verse 47, we see the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus. One of the twelve comes up, uh, Judas, and he leads the folks who will arrest Jesus. Notice what it says in Matthew 26 and verse 56. All this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then what happened? All the disciples left him and fled. Then we see a trial, if I could call it a trial, a fake trial, right? What does Jesus do in the midst of the trial? We see it. Matthew tells us in verse 63, Jesus remained 
silence. He didn't fight back and retaliate against the false charges. Then we see after, as the trial's going on, what's happening? Peter is denying Jesus. Peter's denying him. On and on the story goes, and at the end of uh, the crucifixion, what we have is Jesus has been beaten, he's been mocked, he's been spit upon, he's had a cor- uh, crown of thorns beaten into his skull, he's been lashed on his back, he's been hung naked on a cross, and everyone has desert- deserted him. And Matthew doesn't record this statement, but do you know one of the things Jesus says on the cross? He says about seven things as he hangs on the cross. One of the things Jesus says as he hangs on the cross is, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Do you see how Jesus perfectly fulfills the teaching in Matthew 5? Don't resist the one who is evil. Don't resist the one who is evil. So each one of us, as we think about this teaching, we must turn to Jesus who perfectly fulfills it. And we say, Jesus, I'm one of the evil ones, and I need you to save me. I need your perfect life to count for me. I need your sacrificial, substitutionary death to count for me. If that's you this morning, I would encourage you to reach out to whoever brought you here. If a member of the church brought you here, reach out. What was all that Jesus stuff? Like, I need to learn more about that. See Pastor Ted or Pastor Mike or Hutch and and just talk to them about that. I need to know this Jesus. But if that's you, if you've already done that, you've already been initially called, but you need to work on this anger, you need to work on this bent towards retaliation, we need to walk in the ways of Jesus. And I'm going to conclude with us in 1 Peter. So if you can, turn with me over to 1 Peter. He gives us an excellent picture of what it looks like to walk in the example of Jesus. We who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven are to see Jesus' examples and we are to repent of our evil ways. We're to trust in God through Jesus for mercy and we're supposed to live likewise. Pick it up with me in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 21. For to this you have been called... Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Right? Did you hear that? Jesus suffered for you. Right? You were evil. Jesus suffered for you. Now he has left you an example so that you might follow in his steps and suffer for others. Verse 22, he, Jesus, committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Brothers and sisters, we need to fall at the feet of Jesus for forgiveness of our sins against God and against our fellow man. And then we need to take up our cross daily and we need to be about the business of showing mercy to others showing forgiveness to others, and walking in the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. I love you guys. Let's pray. God, we are so ready for retaliation. We're just ready. Sometimes we show up to places looking for an argument. Sometimes we show up to places looking for a fight. But God, we need to turn to you, Jesus. We need to see that you did not live your life that way. 
You lived your life perfectly, and part of that perfect life was not retaliating against those who were against him. So God, I pray that you would help each one of us here to walk more in the path of Jesus, that we would grow more and more like him each day. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.